Hi everyone, welcome to Mitigating Supply Chain Risk in Today's Uncertain World. Uh, I'm here with Tom Gordon, he's going to be our presenter today. Um, but I am Kaylee Pogue in Missouri Enterprise, we're the state's uh, NIST MEP center. So what that means is that we get to focus on helping support and grow manufacturing in Missouri. Um, as the MEP center for Missouri, we are impact driven, which means that we kind of rely on your survey results a little bit. Um, at the end of today's session, there will be a link that we send in the chat for you guys to click through there to go to the survey and fill out for us quickly. Um, it should only take about maybe five minutes of your time. It's only 10 questions, but we would really love your feedback. Uh, with that being said, I think we're going to go ahead and try to get started. And again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and please direct your questions to the chat or you can wait until the end and we can answer them live. So, but with that, Tom. Where are my parts? Oh, come on, Kaylee. I bought them from those people you told me to buy from. You said they were cheap and you said they were reliable and you said they made good quality. What's wrong with you? Why haven't they turned up? I don't know. I'm asking you. <laughs> it's very embarrassing, isn't it? Probably the most embarrassing thing you can happen to anyone in manufacturing to have a line stopped waiting for silly parts. You know, this is a great risk but it's also a big opportunity. It's an opportunity for you to service your customers, but it's a risk letting your customers down. So according to Apex figures, 60% of material costs are in purchased material. So that seems to imply that buying, purchasing, supply chain management is very much a strategic activity. And if you think about it, what is the lowest level in the bill of material? The purchase product. So if you haven't got that, the whole thing falls apart. So can you explain what you're trying to show us here, Tom? Yeah, we're talking about failure costs. According to APEX, the Association of Supply Chain Management today, about 10,000 containers go over the side into the South China Sea. And it's not surprising, really, if you think of a, a big ship loaded up with all these containers. There's a bit of a storm, so we sling some containers over the side. And you can bet your life, of course, that your critical parts and one of the containers that goes over, over the side. And there's nothing you can do about it. And the problem is, it probably takes you three, six, eight months to get another container load of those parts. Failure costs can cost you about 7% in sales. Now, think about it. If you cannot supply your customer, where do they go to? They go to somewhere else. Inventory can go up. You can buy, you can overload your inventory. And typically, if you don't manage your supply chain, according to, again to Apex figures, inventory can increase by about 14%. And of course, the cost of goods sold can go up as well. So it's very important to understand how vital your supply chain is to the health of your organization. Okay, but before we dig in too deep, Tom, why don't you explain to us what risk is? Well, those of you who are ISO certified, 9001, 6.2, it talks about risk and opportunity. And as I said earlier, what is a risk to you? might be an opportunity to one of your competitors. So you've got to look at it in that frame of mind. You've got to plan for risk. You've got to have a disaster recovery plan. You've got to decide what to do if something goes wrong. Now, so what can go wrong? Well, risk is defined as a wide range of possible events that can go wrong. And think about it. You sit in a seat in an aircraft you're going somewhere. What has it taken to get you into that seat? And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But there's a whole plethora of risks that can occur in your supply chain if you don't manage it. But then there's a couple of different types of risks. So do you mind breaking those down for us? Yeah, there's the hard risks, the risks that are tangible. Perhaps if you've got empirical evidence, Pr productive assets, if your machines break down, Inventory, your inventory is inaccurate or you can't find the parts. You've, you haven't got the facilities. 
reasonable known values of loss if this sort of risk occurs because you have got empirical evidence. But much more to the point are the soft risks. These are a risk which are very, very difficult to measure or to determine. And the soft risks are the things that can actually close your business. Okay, now you have a term for so a lot of soft risks, kind of unexpected events, and you call them black swans. Why don't you explain what that means? Yeah, alas, this is not my term. I wish it was. It's a great idea. But think about a black swan. Before people went to Austin, Australia, they thought all swans were white. And then all of a sudden, they saw these black swans. Totally unexpected. All swans are white. We've got empirical evidence. We see white swans all over the place. But then all of a sudden, a black swan appears. Now, I quote P.G. Woodhouse's Jeeves book here, because I think it's very appropriate. Those of you who have read P.G. Woodhouse know that Jeeves is Bertie Wooster's gentleman's gentleman and is always digging Bertie out of difficult situations and one of the situations that appertain to swans is Bertie has been attacked by a very angry swan and Jeeves comes wrong with his umbrella and opens it in front of the swan and the swan backs off. Well unfortunately Jeeves is not always going to be there with his umbrella the problem is yours. We don't have gentlemen's gentlemen. So the problem is yours. You've got to try and anticipate as much as possible. But unfortunately, a black swan is no empirical evidence. So what do you do? Well, we're going to talk about how we plan for the unexpected as we go on into this hour. All right. So obviously COVID has been a huge black swan for everybody. It's, mm -hmm. it's, everybody still fulfills all the ripple effects that it's caused for our supply chains. Uh, but then also we had the Suez Canal situation. Why don't you touch on that a minute for us? Yeah, this is great. A ship going aground in the Suez Canal. How come? I mean, it's a straight line, isn't it? Between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. How can it possibly go aground? Well, it's said that this ship being aground cost about $9.6 billion a day in blocking up the Suez Canal. Because it's not only this ship and the parts on that ship, but of course no other ship could go down the canal. Now, a really sad thing is that although it only took about a week to get the ship on the go again, it was only last week where that ship actually arrived at the home port to unload its goods. So, what do you do? If you're going to send stuff round the Suez Canal in massive, massive great container ships, you'd better be prepared for these eventualities. Unfortunately, and he's not on this webinar, but a gentleman who runs a factory in my university town of Leeds, he had a load of stuff on that ship. And I did commiserate with him and send him sort of sentimental emails and said, but you really shouldn't buy from China, Tim. It's a big problem. All right. So, and then you've got this uh, chain, so to say, up here on the screen. Why don't you break that down? Well, this is a very simplified picture of a supply chain. And of course, a chain is a misnomer. It's a matrix, interconnected matrix. And this is taken from the Apex Risk Management um, Certificate class. But think about it. It's a very simple chain. It's a very simple matrix. Think, as I said earlier, think about when you're sitting in an aircraft seat. What has it taken to get you there? And there's all kinds of things can go wrong. Some of the nine things that can go wrong are lifted above. Financial stability. Your vendor goes out of business. Lead times. Your vendor ship is stuck in the Suez Canal. Quality. Your vendor sends you a load of rubbish. And of course, if you do have to have people inspecting the incoming goods, where does that cost go? And we'll talk about this next week in the total cost of ownership. Government stability. This is very appropriate at the moment. We're worried about government stability in a lot of countries. Labour strikes. Capacity. Toyota found this when a tsunami washed their brake factory away. 
they had an alternative supplier, but it took the alternative supplier an awful long time to gear up to meet Toyota's needs. Weather. Unfortunately, the world is getting warmer. The weather is going to be a lot more unpredictable. So we've got to cater for that. And then cyber threats. Cyber threats is a big problem today in most industries. 15, 20 years ago, it was the big companies that were targeted. But now, as the big companies have got all these white hat hackers who sort out their systems, it's going down the chain into smaller companies. And remember, the hacker only has to get it right once. The company has got it to right, get it right many, 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 many times. But of course, it's a Darwinian process. Once you close one door, another will open. And then, of course, the competition. If your supply chain fails and you can't service your customer, then what an opportunity for your competition. All right. Why don't you explain the cross-functional supply chain view? Well, people of my generation thought about purchasing as one isolated department. You know, they get their output from the MRP every week and that's it. They order the parts. Well, it's a lot more complicated than that. The orange bits in the diagram, and this again is taken from the Apex material, the orange bits are the internal things that you have to worry about. Managing procurement, yes, but making the product, managing the distribution, and fitting into this is the outside things, developing the products and services, performing the marketing and sales. And of course, we mustn't forget about the key support processes. Finance, how have we got the money to pay? Can we buy stuff? What about people? How have we got the people to make stuff? So this value chain is really rather complex. So we're getting away from the simplistic idea that I was given when I was younger to something much more complex and much more realistic. So, but then there's a couple of different models that supply chains can mimic. Uh, why don't you explain to us which one's more beneficial? Well, this is a good point. If you look at any forecasting module, it's deterministic. The theory is that the higher the level and the more current the information is, the more accurate your forecast is going to be. Walmart can probably tell you to the 10 tons how many um, cornflakes are going to sell in the United States this year. But when it comes down to the actual Walmart businesses, they've no idea. Because the st stochastic model is really what we should be considering. The great historian, Neil Ferguson, has said there's many, many futures. And this is what the stochastic model is about. We can't use the deterministic model to make sure that we know what we're going to do. We've got to take this stochastic model into account and we've got to manage our systems. And if we just rely on a deterministic model, we're going to find either we'll lose a lot of business because we're out of parts, or we've got warehouses full of stuff that we can't sell. So we have the mass production schedule. In theory, this is what we're going to do within our time fence. That drives the material requirements planning. And that, in theory, deterministic, tells the people exactly what to buy. But there's a lot of other things, lots of other variables. Inventory accuracy, which we'll talk about in a moment. Bill of material accuracy, capacity. And then there's the hidden things in the item master file. Batch sizes, yields, quality percentages, lead time, which are all variables. And we've got to make sure that we don't forget about these. All right. And there's several emerging risks that you talk about often. Why don't you kind of explain what some of those are today? Oh, yeah. Climate change. You know, the Kobe earthquake in 1995 really impacted Toyota because it washed away the company that was making their brakes. It's minor part of a car, I should imagine but a vital part of the car. You can't sell cars without brakes, although I'm sure some people tried. 
So climate change is something we've got to appreciate now. We've got to cater for that. We've got to think, well, where are our key suppliers? Where are they located? Are they located on a cliff overlooking the ocean? Or are they located in California, which is burning at the moment, all due to climate change? And then, of course, there's a plastic and packaging invasion. The world is drowning in plastic packaging. What do we do about that? How do we recycle that? And the increased terrorism, the fear of terrorism, and this, of course, this week is very much on everybody's mind. What's going to happen with Al-Qaeda? Are they going to revert to type? Are they going to try and impact the Western society again? And I mentioned, of course, the cyber security issues. We cannot stress this enough. And when we talk about the ERP implementation in two weeks, is it two weeks? This is something that we've really got to concern ourselves about. It's pointless having a very expensive and well-maintained and well-operated ERP system. And then what happens? Some hacker gets into it and you cannot ship our product. And then there's the social media threats. What people are saying about your business on social media. Will this impact your business? And finally, ethics. We're going to talk a lot about ethics in the next few minutes because an ethical company is something that A, we want to be and B, we want to deal with. So to the point of ethics, there's several tools out there that you can kind of use to help mitigate that risk in itself. So why don't you tell us about this scenario here and then maybe some tools to help avoiding that in the future. Well, this is a situation recently where a factory in India was exploiting workers by making them work 23 hours a day without going to the bathroom. The sad thing is that company was ISO certified for two days a year when the external assessor was in there. The rest of the time they're exploiting their workers. United States Customs are stopping gloves coming in from Malaysia because of ethical concerns. A recent thing on the BBC News was a situation in Uganda where children are now panning for gold because they haven't got any money. Is if you buy the three, any of the three T's and G's that we talk about, the conflict materials, this is something you've really got to think about. Where do they come from? Who is digging this up? The ethical considerations. Do we want to be involved with companies that are not ethical? So then there's corporate social responsibility. That's kind of one of the tools I was referring to. Why don't you tell us about the standards for that? Yeah, corporate responsibility. The great poet John Donne said, no man is an island unique to themselves. And this is what he's talking about, really. Corporate social responsibility. We're all in one world. There's an ISO standard, 26,000, about social responsibility. But the thing is, we've got to understand that businesses and organisations do not operate in a vacuum, as John Donne said. No man is an island. No business is an island unique to themselves. So we've got to make sure, really, if we're an ethical company, that we only have partnerships with ethical suppliers. However, the cost might be in money. We think about the social cost. And of course, we cannot compromise the needs of future generations. I'm probably going to be dead in five or ten years, something like that. But I've got grandchildren. And I worry about the world that we leave in, leave in them. I'm worried about the increase of temperature. I'm worried about all the pollution that we're creating. So we must not compromise the needs of future generations for short-term gains. So there's a lot of benefits to social responsibility and kind of implementing these in kind of several different areas. Why don't you talk about those too? Absolutely. If you know you've got an ethical supplier, you're going to buy from them. Period. You know that that supplier is not breaking any rules, is not doing anything unethical. 
And of course, your customers must know that you are an ethical company. What a marketing advantage it is in the long term, because short term gains do not last in the long term. Only an ethical company will survive in the long term. And of course, this feeds into the community and the general public. Are you an organisation that people want to work for, work with? Are you an organisation that the local authorities, the local people are proud that you're part of their, business, their environment? Which really brings me to environmental. Um, what are you doing with your scrap? What are you doing with your waste? How are you controlling all that? And it's very important for the future of the world that we do control our environment. So, but then there's also the 10 principles and you'll have to explain kind of how that differs and where that comes from in comparison to CSR. Yeah, these, the United Nations principles, 10 principles of ethics. There's four areas really, human rights, labor practices, environment, and anti-corruption. Human rights, support and protect internationally proclaimed human rights. Ensure non-complicity with human rights abuses. We're all people. We've got to make sure that we all treat each other ethically and reasonably. And we don't buy from warlords in the Congo, however cheap their products are. And then labour practices, uphold the freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining. You know, in Britain, 1799 and 1801, the combination laws tried to restrict collective bargaining to make profits, exploiting the workers. That's not ethical. Eliminate forced and compuls compulsory labour. I mentioned a few seconds ago about the recent thing that's in Uganda, which has come across. Children mining gold or panning the rivers for gold. We don't want our children doing that. That's crazy. And then, of course, we want to eliminate dis discrimination in employment and occupation. Studies show that the more diverse a company is, the more creative they are. And the more creative they are, the better place they are in the marketplace. If they can create new products, if they can lead fashions, but you don't do this when you've just got a slab of people who have got the same biased ideas. So eliminate description, discrimination in employment and occupation. And of course, the environment, I keep touching about the environment, support a cautionary approach to environmental challenges, promote greater environmental responsibility, encourage the development and diffusion of environmentally friendly technologies. And that's easier said than done. So seven, eight and nine, if we think about electric vehicles, what a great idea. However, what do we do with the batteries when their useful life is finished? At the moment, there is no easy and safe way to recycle those batteries. We've got to think about this. And then, of course, anti-corruption. There's a Hindi word, bakshish, which means corruption. You know, um, it's all very good and it makes good entertainment and good television. But is it really the world we want to live in? You know, give me a handout and I'll do this for you. Give me a handout and you won't go to jail. So we've got to think about the ethical supply channel and a supplier and a company that's based on these 10 principles is really, really well ahead of anybody else in the long term. So that's a, some obviously pretty great tools for mitigating the ethical risks that we see today. But then there's all the other, you know, typical supply chain issues that we come across. And for Absolutely. those, is inventory the answer? Inventory the answer. Let's have so much inventory we can't move, but we don't worry about anybody else. Inventory is interesting. There's a big cost in inventory. And this is where the old idea 
of economic order quantity comes from. It balanced order cost with storage cost. But of course, it wasn't very accurate. It costs money to keep inventory. You have to heat it, light it, move it, count it. But what about the opportunity cost? If you've got money invested in inventory, you can't spend it on anything else. Particularly if it's inventory that you don't want. Now, if you do not know what you've got, or if you do not know where it is, then it's pointless having all this inventory, isn't it? It's just adding cost. So we think about the opportunity cost of inventory. Okay. So now, the traditional perfect order. 100% of the product, right place, right time, right quality. That's a great idea, isn't it? When you need it. But it doesn't always work like that. So then can I tell us what's a better method? A better method is to think about it. Just enough desirable inventory. This is nothing to do with Star Wars. It just happens that they picked up this idea. So what do we really need to meet the current mass production schedule? As long as the current master, master production schedule is based upon rough cut capacity planning and resource requirements planning and the sales and operations plan, then it's valid. So what do we need? Well, this is where the inventory quality ratio comes in. We only have the inventory to meet the requirements of the mass production schedule in this period. So if we have established time fences today and the demand time fence, this is what we're talking about. This is what we need inventory for. We don't need inventory to keep us going until Haley's Comet comes around again. Because this is the opportunity cost of inventory. There's the risk of obsolescence, damage, engineering change, customer fashion changes. Now, when I bring this up in some companies, I say, oh, Tom, come on. We can always rework that part or those parts. I mean, we can sell it for $30 and it only costs us $50 to rework it. So it's better to be able to spend that money and have the part. Is that false economy? I think so. And the other thing about inventory is that if your inventory levels are inaccurate, and by inventory levels, I mean count and location. You're heading for disaster. You can't plan on this. If you don't cycle count, if you don't know where you're putting stuff, then you haven't got it. Are you trying to tell us that that's going to cause a problem? <coughs> so yeah, yeah, maybe so. Um, so then there's some you know, kind of, you can rate your risks though and maybe tackle it that way. Is that, can you break that, talk well, about that? That's, that's a good point. Like all consultants, I steal with pride and I stole this from the United States Army Infantry Manual. Basically, you've got to think about the real risks. You know, Kipling, in one of his poems, if, put it, if you can make a pile of all your winnings and risk it on one turn of pitch and toss, and lose and start at your beginnings and never breathe a word about your loss. Well, that's okay for individuals. In fact, it's quite fun sometimes, but for a business, it is not okay. You've got a lot of stakeholders in your business, and not only your workers, the shareholders, the management, the families of the people. What about the coffee shop down the road where your people go for the morning coffee? There's lots and lots of stakeholders in your business. So you've got to really think about taking care of those stakeholders, but you can't do everything. There's nothing we can do about an asteroid hitting the earth. I mean, worry about it, but there's nothing we can do about it. Ask the dinosaurs. So what we've got to do is categorize the risk. We've got to figure out what is likely and what is severe. And we've got to plan on the red areas and once we've planned on the red areas, we can start planning on the orange areas, of course, but the green areas probably are not something we should worry about. Unless, of course, you get the old black swan has turned green. 
and then you've really got a problem. So then what's the one basic rule? The one basic rule about vendors is know your vendor's system and factory as well as you know your own. You really got to make sure you buy from people who are reliable, ethical, do produce good quality, deliver on time, all this sort of stuff. And the only way to know this really is to build relationships with your vendors. One way of course is to do second party audits. You've got an internal audit team if you're ISO 9000 certified, send them to the vendors to do internal audits. Look at the finances, look at their processes, look at their way that they operate the system. Now, one of the big problems, of course, is that um, they may be kidding you. Another big problem, of course, is you can hardly do that in China if your vendor is in China. I mean, they can go out and spend an awful lot of money, but it's a big problem. So you've got to make sure that if you, for instance, accept an ISO 9001 certification, it's from a reasonable registrar, not just anybody. You know, and we've had a lot of trouble in the ISO world in the last, what, 40, 50 years with varying degrees of expertise in registration certification bodies. We've had a lot of trouble. It's supposed to be a level playing field, but is it? So, but then there's a price of not knowing your suppliers. So why don't you talk to us about oh, repercussions of yes. that? This is really sad. And this is taken from The Economist, October the 14th, 2017. Kobe Steel, which surely the vast majority of us on October the 13th, 2017, thought were a very ethical supplier. It turns out they were falsifying certificates of analysis on aluminium, copper and steel products. Well, some of those products are used on the Mars rover. A little bit difficult to recall. Katie. You don't want to go up there and get it? No, let Jeff Bezos do that. <laughs> I don't want to do that. You know, I mean, it's supposed to be an awful place. But that's the problem, isn't it? You rely on an ethical supplier. You rely on them to give you an accurate certificate of analysis. But when they falsify it, yeah, what do you do? Kind of brings up a problem. So then there's some rules of criticality that you're going to talk about. Yes, rules of criticality. I like to think of a pile of sand. You can keep piling sand up until one point the extra grain causes an avalanche. And this is the essence of criticality. ABC analysis does not help criticality. If you have a product that requires a warning label on the side and you haven't got the warning label, that is a critical item. So ABC analysis will not help you. Your warning labels are probably class C items or even class D items. And then all of a sudden you haven't got it and you've got a lot of product waiting to be shipped. Supplier lead time. Supplier lead time varies. If you buy in Maine, in the summer, you're going to have problems with all the tourists. In the winter, you're going to have problems with all the snow and all that sort of stuff. So there's only going to be a couple of weeks in a year where you can actually have a standard lead time. So you've got to think about supplier lead time. And of course, that translates into supplier capacity. We've got to make sure that the supplier sells us quality products. We're not really interested in buying bad stuff. We're not paying for bad stuff. There's a classical tale of Motorola. They required 10%. They were accepting 10% quality, poor quality. And they got a shipment of um, products from a Japanese electronic company. All the products in the box were good, 100% quality but they had a bag on the side, 10% poor quality. If we accept 
quality variations like that, then it's going to cost us money. We've got to think about the availability of alternatives. Now, the Toyota example is a perfect example. They did have an alternative brake supplier after the tsunami, but the problem was the alternative brake supplier gearing up to meet their requirements. So we've got to think about supplier impactants, storms, tsunamis, getting more topical, snow, forest fires, which is very topical at the moment, strikes. These are things that impact your supplier, which also impact your business. So what do we do about this? Open book communications, sharing the mass production schedule. When I first learned this years ago and I suggested it in a company, people said, oh, we don't want to share the mass production schedule, Tom, because the vendors know what we're doing. Well, the vendors know what we're doing because they're selling us parts. The great Holly White, 40, 50 years ago, suggested this open communication with your vendors, with your key vendors. Give them the master production schedule. Let them see what's coming down the track. And this avoids the... Bullwhip effect, yes. The bullwhip effect. The bullwhip effect is called because a slight twist in the wrist at one point creates a big variation at the other point. And this is what happens to your vendors. If you have a slight change of demand, it may seem insignificant to you, but it causes a lot of disruption down the line. And if you keep doing this, why would your vendors want to work with you? Because the vendors can say, no, we don't want to work with you guys. You're too difficult. And I'm sure we've all in industry come across that. So what can we do? So rather you'd probably like to have a nice overview, yes? Yeah. Uh, one of the things we can do, and this is getting very topical at the moment in good ERP systems, is the creation of control towers, vendor control towers, giving us visibility all the way through the supplier chain so that people know exactly what we're looking for and people know exactly what's expected of them and can plan and cater to those changes. Talk to us about how blockchain is relevant for today's world. Well, the blockchain in its simplest form is a distributed ledger. High security powered by cryptography. These elements provide a trustworthy network with business, legal and technical opportunities, capabilities, facilitating secure communications, which is very important in this world of cyber crime. In secure communications throughout the supply chain. So, so considering supply channel mitigation, talk to us about that. Well, hopefully we're all growing and we're changing. Think of our product range. Our products go through a cycle. They start as the problem child, then they're going to the rising star quadrant, then they're going to the cash cow quadrant, and then they fall down until nobody wants them. So growing and changing, we've got to think about how that works. We've got to unify our supply chain, making sure that we have optimum solutions, making sure that our supply chain adds value. And the only way to do those three things is by planning and planning again. Again, the great Holly White said, and he was absolutely right, if purchasing gets it wrong, we may as well all just go home because we can't do anything. We can't make anything if we haven't got the bits. Yeah, sounds like a smart guy. So uh, when it comes to assessing and controlling risks, what are some tools that you can do? Well, a good thing to start with is do a supplier channel risk man mapping. What I tend to think of as a value stream mapping. How does it work? Where do we get our products from? What are the channels? What are some of the problems? What are some of the hiccups in it? And then we can figure out a supplier credit rating. Now, in the little book that we've produced to go along with these courses, there's some checklists which you can use. And this book is free from your area business manager. He'll quite willing to bring it out to you and give it to you. But there's some checklists which allow you to develop a supplier credit rating. 
We've got to think of the business impact analysis if our suppliers go away. We've got to think about our disaster recovery plans. What happens if our supplier's factory burns down? What happens if our factory burns down? What is our recovery? What is our time to recovery? We need to do third party research and gather intelligence. How many of us in business look at the Harvard Business Review, look at Thorpe's, look at The Economist? This is where we can get business intelligence from. And finally, there's an engineering technique called failure mode effect analysis, which looks at the se severity, the likelihood, and the detection of a problem and creates a thing called an RPM, uh, risk, risk priority number. This is probably something we could adapt to the supply chain. And this is something that we do when we do supply chain assessments. So then some tools that kind of help with this? Yeah. Value at risk. What will it cost us if a supplier fails? You know, 20 years ago, the thing was single source suppliers. And then good old chainsaw Al Dunlap kind of dirted this by telling the single source suppliers, next week you're going to cut your cost by 5%. And that's why it's called chainsaw Al. So we've got to think about what happens if our suppliers fail? If they have a problem, what about time to recovery? How long will it take them to recover? If they're hacked or something and their systems don't work, how long will it take them to get back online? Some of the statistical process tools. Addressing the stochastic optimization with empirical knowledge. Looking at everything that's happened and trying to evaluate all the different events that could happen. And of course, the heat maps. This is always a great thing. Look at where your suppliers are. What are the hotspots? What are the things you really need to worry about? And last week, of course, one of the major ports in China, I think it was the second biggest port, has been closed down because of COVID. And that was something else in The Economist, of course, mentioned in this. So we try to calculate a resilience e index. How resilient is our supply chain? Is our supply chain sustainable? So, but then there's some metrics for mitigating risk. We, without plugging the uh, Association of Supply Chain Management, what we used to call APEX, this is a great tool that they've developed. It's called SCORE, uh, Supplier Chain Optimizer, uh, Supplier Chain Operations Reference Model score. You can do a course on score. You can actually, we do actually cover it in the CPIM and the Certified Supply Chain Management certifications. But SCORE is a great tool. It's a multifaceted and multi-level collection of metrics used to evaluate a potential supplier. So we've got these five top level metrics. Reliability. How reliable is your supplier? How responsive are they to your needs? How agile are they? How can they really think on their feet? What are the costs? And of course, how stable are they? What are their assets? And this can break down to three levels. The third level allows you to tailor the metrics to your particular manufacturing environment. Because if you're engineering to order, your supplier chain is different than if you are manufacturing to stock. So the score metrics at the third level allow you to tailor this. It's well worth doing. Another thing we do is ARP 9134. It's an aerospace recommended practice which has got universal applications. It's supplier chain risk. And there are some very, very good tools in ARP 9134. And typically when we do supplier chain evaluations, this is one of the base documents that we actually do use. Mm -hmm. So, and explain supplier relationships. Well, what do we want? I was brought up to look at suppliers as we su succeed in spite of the suppliers. We want to grind them down on cost. We, you know, they're, they're, they're really not our friends. 
What a stupid way to carry on. On the right hand side, we're talking about collaborative relationships, strategic alliances, partnership type relationships. The advantage of a collaborative relationship is that if you want to produce a product and you haven't quite got the expertise in-house to produce this product, then perhaps one of your collaborative partners in the supply chain has that expertise. So they can develop it with you and you can have a collaborative product. And this is the best way to go on, working with people. We're all in the same boat, let's face it. And if you can help your supplier, they can help you help your customer. And that's what it is. It's a high value added relationship going to the right. So, and then the maturity model, want to explain that for us. This is a great maturity model. We look at supplier chain visibility. That's the very basic. Then we go up the model to the right. We look at predictability, resiliency, and sustainability. If all our vendors are in the green box, then there's a big reduction in the risk that we have to worry about. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's all very well, Tom, but what do we do? How do we start? Well, a good place to start is to appoint a supply chain risk assessment team or manager, someone with the authority and responsibility for this. Give them the support and responsibility because it is a strategic aspect of your business. Start looking at the aspects that will fit in your control tower. And of course, let Missouri Enterprise help you. We provide this book, a handbook for supply chain executives, which your ABM will be very happy to give you. But another tool, which we're going to talk about at the moment, is called Connex Missouri. And this is a national thing. And I'm going to bring in Jeff Wilkins now, who is going to talk to you about the Connex system. Jeff? Great, thank you. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. Um, really great information. I appreciate uh, you sharing all that with us. And also, we would like to share with you from here at Missouri Enterprise our Connex program that we're bringing along. Uh, Connex Missouri, if you have not heard yet, is coming to Missouri Enterprise and to the state of Missouri. Uh, it's it's going to be a statewide manufacturing supply chain database uh, here in Missouri. Uh, it's free for all Missouri manufacturers, so any qualified uh, manufacturer can uh, join up to it. We ask, we ask all many, every manufacturer is going to be inputted into the database currently through the state of Missouri. Um, it, it also connects up with the national database. Uh, so the national database has about 140,000 uh, different manufacturers listed on it. Um, but what we're asking actually is uh, for Missouri manufacturers to create a profile, connect connect up with us. Uh, we can help you create that profile. You can go to our website at Missouri uh, MissouriEnterprise.org and check out the Connects page and then you, pre -re you can currently pre-register for the database. Um, but it, it allows you to, you know, create access to new suppliers and buyers through Missouri Connects. It connects up with the NAMS Manufacturing Marketplace, which is a nation nationwide database. It's going to streamline connections between manufacturers that better connect with each other to be discovered and increased opportunities. And it provides in-depth information for manufacturers to, you know, look through and and highlight and search certain capability statements, uh, certifications, equipment, materials, types, and things like that, that and, and able to have manufacturers connect up with each other. So um, the access is available for a nationwide uh, database for the manufacturers to create a membership and um, create that account. And within those first 30 or 60 days as, as of our launch, which is September 1st, uh, manufacturers have 60 days con to connect up uh, into the, the Connects database and have a free lifetime membership. So it's a really great opportunity to not only connect up with the Missouri manufacturers, but also look here and, and increase that domestic supply chain. So uh, we really hope you uh, to look for us on that. You can contact your ABM. You can look on our webpage and, and reach out to us on there. Uh, we'll be uh, sending some information out, check out our website and all those types of things. So, but Tom, again, thank you for the information today. And uh, Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, and uh, Marshall uh, also said hi. So. Oh, great <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Well, what a great system. And think about it, your supply chain. If your supply chain is domestic, it's a lot more predictable. 
However much we hate driving on I-70 and I-44, it's still a lot easier than bringing stuff through the South China Sea or anywhere else. But anyway, hey, Kaylee, do you want to round up, please? Yeah, so thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We really appreciate it, and hopefully you got some valuable insights out of uh, Tom's information that he delivered. As he said, you know, there is a supply chain handbook that's getting ready to come out. Uh, you can contact your local ABM for that. And if you don't know who that is, feel free to visit our website. There's a tool actually that you can go down at the bottom. You just type in your zip code and it'll tell you pretty quickly actually who your ABM is. Uh, also, as I mentioned before we got started today, there is going to be a survey sent through the chat here in just a minute. If you would please fill that out, we'd really appreciate it. And uh, unless anybody has any questions, we'll go ahead and conclude today's presentation. But please feel free to ask anything you need to. So thank you all very much.